All right, hello, I am here with Erica Monet Greer again. If you have not seen our first video where we discussed creation mythologies, uh, go back to YouTube and look for that one. Or if you're one of my students, you should have already seen that video as part of your homework for our class, The Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, for those that did not see the first video, let me introduce uh, Erica once again. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, as well as an adjunct professor who teaches course in Hebrew, courses in Hebrew Bible, ancient Near Eastern culture, and Semitic languages like Hebrew and Akkadian. Her most recent faculty positions were at Northwest Christian University and University of Oregon in Eugene, where she lives with her partner, Joshua, their two children, Caleb and Emma, and adopted dog, Zuzu. Uh, Erica's research includes justice for the poor in the Hebrew Psalter, biblical ethics, and religion in science fiction. And today she's here with me to talk about flood mythologies. As my students know, I teach the Hebrew Bible, but my expertise is more on the Christian New Testament, especially the gospel. So I am thankful to be able to have uh, friends and fellow scholars who I can rope in, who can tell me about things that they have greater insight into, and that way my students can benefit and anyone that comes across this video on YouTube. So welcome back, Erica, uh, for a second discussion on um, ancient mythologies. So let's begin with the first question that I have for you here. This week, my students will have read about the great deluge in Genesis 6-9. In the context of the book of Genesis, what's the point of this story? Why does Yahweh God flood the entire earth? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, so in Genesis 6-9, through uh, we definitely are presented with this question about purpose. Why does this happen? Um, one thing I think that is important to look at, especially in light of the previous conversation we had, is uh, this narrative is a telling, a cosmogony telling. It's, a, it's an act of creation. Um, it's actually an act of uncreation and recreation of the world. And I think primarily that would be a good way to frame the view of this text. Uh, in this sense, the narrative could be read alongside Genesis 1 and 2, and so we kind of are picking up on that discussion uh, from beginning of the world stories. And that also, you'll see, will be mirrored in the way that other ancient Near Eastern epics are lined up, where we have creation of the universe, and then we have the flood uh, narrative, or the great deluge narrative. Um, so we've also talked about some parallel concepts mirrored in Genesis 1 and in the flood narrative in Genesis 6 through 9. Uh, one similarity is the listing of each kind of thing or species as it is removed from creation. We'll read in, in Genesis 7, 17 through 23, we see that the waters kept on coming, increasing on the earth. They came up from the ground and down from the sky. And God, because God had removed the firmament, which held back the rain and the waters in the sky, and there was no more arid land or dry land. The land became um, basically like, like if you could imagine springs or wells coming up from the from the ground uh, so then we have the watery chaos which preceded creation in genesis 1 um, restored as the waters flooded all of the universe and every or the creation or the land and every living thing on the earth perished and we get a list again the birds perished the beasts the swarming creatures and then finally at the end humankind is wiped out uh, the single exception of the story is that the primeval beginning has one carryover from the former world of creation, and that is a human family and a sample of all animals from that previous creation emanation. So in the recreation, God begins creation with an ascribed purpose, and that's remembering Noah, remembering humankind. It's like God gave Noah this task so that there would be, it would be like a reminder, <laughs> it seems, of why God wants to create the world again. Uh, and, the, and the text uses that word remember uh, for God's, for God's an initiating action. Uh, Noah is the answer to God's question. Is there good in humanity? Or at least is there something worthy to preserve in humanity? So God creates again by breathing over the earth so that the waters separate once again, just like in uh, Genesis 1 where the, the breath of God or the wind of God hovered over the chaotic waters. The firmament again becomes functional and the rain stops falling. Uh, time takes its course and allows the waters to recede so that life can resume on the land. 
uh, God does not create animals or humankind in this narrative because Noah's family brought all the animal species from the old world. In this sense, the importance of humanity is elevated. Humankind assists God in the recreation of earth in Genesis 6 through 9. The cosmogony here concludes with a reminder that is familiar from the Genesis 1 creation narrative, that is to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And then in chapter nine, we get a continuation of this. What does this mean uh, for humankind and a clarification of the responsibilities of, human, uh, of humans in this version of creation. God establishes a covenant or a contract with the humans. And this covenant then becomes extended to all living things across the world and for time to come. And of course is sealed, famously sealed with the rainbow uh, that scatters um, light across the universe. Very interesting. And I, and I love how this ends up connecting back to the previous discussion. Again, for those who have not gone and watched the last video, we looked at the creation accounts. And now um, we're looking at another creation account, it sounds like, is the way you're presenting it. And not a way of looking at Genesis 69 that I would have usually thought of. I usually am so focused on the destructive element that I forget that there's this brand new creation going on. And yet, a uh, fantastic observation there, there's still this aspect of the previous, the old creation, um, which uh, it's not the question I have written down, but a lot of questions are going through my mind of, of why we have these kinds of stories where some portion of the old creation has to come over to the new creation. Uh, maybe that's for a future interview, or maybe it will tie into one of these other questions that I have for you, um, because that's really at the front of my mind. Like, why not just start over? Why animals and humans? Um, yeah. I hope my, my students um, who in response to this video are asking questions. There's a freebie for you. Why humans? Why, why, uh, an why animals? Why are those the two things that survive? Uh, the second question I have here for you here is that the Hebrews or Israelites or Judites, however we might want to present the group uh, or groupings of people who gave us these stories, they were not the only people from the ancient Near East or the ancient Levant uh, to talk about a giant flood. Very popularly, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, which seems to have some Assyrian and Babylonian influence. And uh, um, if I understand how to pronounce it correctly, the Atrahasis uh, does the same thing. Uh, can you tell us about these two stories? Sure. Um, there, so there's two ancient Near Eastern narratives that share the commonalities with the story of the flood in Genesis. Um, as you said, one is Atrahasis and the other is almost an identical version of Atrahasis that's included in the very long epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, so Atrahasis, I'll start with, is an impressively large and complete mythological narrative poem from the ancient Near East. It begins with uh, the telling of three deities or gods who've divided up the cosmos. Uh, the highest god is named Anu, who has the heavens, Enlil has the earth, and Enki has the watery depths. Uh, these gods then have um, designs for each of their territories and they force the other gods into labor to, on behalf of their designs. So this prompts the creation of humankind to labor on behalf of the gods, um, as we can talk more in detail in the previous interview. Uh, so after a millennia or so, I think 1200 years is, is used in the text, the humans have overpopulated the earth now and they've become so noisy that the gods are annoyed by their clamor. And Enlil, um, one of the deities, forms a plan to extinguish humankind. So he does this in phases. First, he sends a plague. And the hero or the protagonist of our epic, Atrahasis, um, is an exceedingly wise man who speaks with his own god and hears also has a two-way communication relationship with his own god, who is Enki, one of the other three gods. Um, and Enki... Uh, has a relationship and seems to favor Atrahasis. So Enki advises Atrahasis, his favorite human, if you will, how to save humanity from the plague and then humanity is saved. Then Enlil sends a drought and then a famine. And so it's a whole long um, ethic of how he sends these various destructive means to starve out humankind. Um, they're, no they're noisy, he complains, and they're keeping him from a restful sleep. So he has to get rid of the humans. Uh, but Enki advises Atrahasis again uh, coming to him in the form of a dream, and humanity is spared. Uh, so Enlil makes a complaint against Enki for his interference and threatens a great flood as the final act of destruction. In the next scene, Atrahasis um, again has a dream. He appeals to his god Enki for meaning, and Enki tells Atrahasis to flee his house, to leave it behind, and build a boat with a roof over it for protection. 
uh, in later versions of this narrative, so there's multiple versions found through archaeology, uh, in later versions, Enki actually names the vessel Guardian of Life. Enki promises to rain down fish and birds to provide for Atrahasis and, and the people aboard. Um, and so Atrahasis carries out the plans with the help of others. And, and there's a list of other people who are involved on different levels, elders, a carpenter, a reed worker, a rich man, and a poor man. I mean, it basically explains that, that there were many people coming together with different skills and abilities uh, to build this. Um, Atrahasis is said to have slaughtered certain pure or clean animals, and he um, slays fatted animals and um, for a feast before they all come aboard. And he chooses uh, other animals to bring on board. It's not as, uh, not as specific in this narrative uh, as it is in the, in the Genesis narrative as to which animals come, but we get the same sense of the story. Uh, Atrahasis' family comes along with him, and when the storm came, finally, it was catastrophic. Even the gods became afraid in response to this great act of the flood. Uh, the flood lasted for seven days, uh, which is also different from the Genesis account. Uh, the gods even asked, where has Anu, our great god, chief god, gone? Um, they complained that Enlil had gone too far in his destruction, and... Uh, they mourned the loss of humankind, and then um, there's a statement about the gods being pleased and surprised that one human had survived the devastation, and that was Atrahasis. Uh, the birth goddess plays an important role in both this narrative and the one included in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, she has been grieving the loss of humankind, who she took part in, create, in creating, and displays some kind of necklace or jewelry as a sign of eternal remembrance of what was done here and uh, the gods regret for trying to wipe out humankind. Um, so that's the end of the flood part of the Atrahasis epic. Uh, the epic of Gilgamesh is famously the great, greatest work of literature from ancient Mesopotamia. I think even um, my teenage kids have read it in junior high or high school, or portions of it, I should say. Uh, it is thought to have origins in the earliest literary traditions of, of the world of literature, dating back to third millennium BCE. Uh, Gilgamesh was the name of an early king of Uruk, an historic kernel for the epic legend that evolved. The epic of Gilgamesh has been attested widely in ancient Near Eastern literature. There are many versions, and what we have today is a compilation of several fragments written in Akkadian, as well as in other languages, actually discovered in the Levant and Anatolia, which is ancient Turkey at Ugarit, Imar, Megiddo, and Hattusa. And then more recent versions have also been found, not more recent like modern, but more recent than third millennium BCE okay. have been found in ancient royal libraries of Assyria and Babylon. Uh, many cultures adapted elements from the Gilgamesh narrative for local storytelling. Um, and so the section that we're concerned with, with the flood narrative picks up in tablet 10 of the Gil Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh, the hero, is in search for immortality because his best friend has died and he is in mourning. He travels through the underworld and is received by Utnapishtim, whose name means he who found life, and his wife. They are the sole survivors of a great flood. Utnapishtim relays his story to Gilgamesh at this time. Um, Utnapishtim lived in Shurapak, a city located on the bank of the Euphrates River when the great gods decided to make a flood. The father and leader was Anu, so we have the same high god. Um, Enlil was their counselor. We have Ninurta, the birth goddess, and other gods involved. Um, but the name of the god who uh, has a relationship with Utnapishtim this time is named Ea, uh, represented with the Latin letters E and A. He gave him a message to dismantle his house and build a boat. So like in the other story, he warned him to reject everything that he had in order to save lives. That was the ultimate goal of, of Unapishtim. He was instructed to preserve seeds of all living things on the boat. Uh, the boat should have uh, all dimensions in proportion, according to this text. It's a, the, the god instructed him to make the boat width and length in harmony. Uh, the roof securing the top. And when Utnapishtim questioned Ea regarding how he should tell the others, we get this kind of uh, prophetic style response where Ea says, you know, um, speak on behalf of me and say that Ea sent you and uh, because this god Elil has rejected me, I cannot stay in your city and now we must build a boat to escape. 
Uh, so then he builds his boat. And again, we get a list of people who contributed very similarly to Atrahasis, the carpenter, the reed worker, the young men, the children, and the poor all contributed to the boat. Details of the construction follow this. There's a division of decks, paddles, bitumen, and pitch, which are also in the, the Genesis narrative. Uh, and then again, we have a, the, other, the similar conclusion, Utnapishtim slaughtered oxen, he sacrificed sheep every day, making um, an appeasement to the gods. He provided drink and food for a festival. And when the boat was finished, he loaded it with silver and gold and the seed of all living things. He loaded it all his family, cattle, wild beasts, and all other kinds of craftsmen to come along, probably to fix the boat as it went. So uh, he then went aboard and closed the door. On the first day, the gods became upset and they grieved for the loss of humans and the devastation. For six days and seven nights, the wind blew, the flood and tempest filled the land. On the seventh day, everything grew calm and all of humankind, it says, has turned to clay at this point who weren't in the boat. The boat came to rest on Mount Nimush and was stuck for six days. So we have the repetition of the seven day cycle in this story. And then on the seventh day, Utnapishtim releases a dove. It returns empty handed. Then he releases a swallow and the same response and then he releases a raven and the raven finds land or whatnot and um, does not return. Um, Utnapishtim makes a sacrifice and the gods smell a pleasing fragrance. Uh, the, the birth goddess again comes and shows off her necklace. This time we get a very um, a better description, her lapis lazuli necklace, which was a very prestigious royal stone and uh, used in that time. And she declares that these times will be remembered forever and they will never forget when they tried to wipe out humanity um, that, they, that they grieved that act. Um, Elil was banned from enjoying the pleasing fragrance of the offering because of his uh, consignment of humankind to destruction. Um, and even though he was angry, he praised the man Utnapishtim for his insight and he is the one who granted immortality to Utnapishtim and his wife, which is brings them to the other side of the underworld where Gilgamesh is searching for uh, immortality. That's a long summary of the story. It's, it's great though, because what I'm hearing is so many different connections to the Genesis flood story, whether it be the people preparing a boat um, in, in relation to some kind of judgment by a deity, um, bringing animals on the boat, there being a certain time period where the waters come and then they have to wait for the waters to recede. They send out some kind of bird to check and see if the waters are receding, there's sacrifices. Uh, I mean, but then at the same time, just like with our creation mythologies, there's gonna be small differences that I'm also hearing that seem to be where, uh, I guess you would say the gold is, is when you wanna make a comparison and contrast there because we hear a lot of the similarities and that sets it up. But then why would the Hebrew narrative differentiate? Um, that's the part for me that always seems to stand out. Mm -hmm. So the next few questions will actually get into a little bit of that, that. But before we jump into um, talking about things like how Noah might be slightly different or how the God and gods are slightly different, uh, let me ask you a question I think might be very important for understanding the relationship between the book of Genesis and these other uh, flood mythologies. Chronologically, what is the relationship between these three stories? What do most scholars think, or which one do most scholars think uh, came first, and how should this impact our understanding of the Bible? Uh, great question. Uh, when it comes to ancient texts, uh, dating and chronology is, is certainly complex. Uh, for one thing, larger epics are often found in segments when they're discovered, and multiple copies attest to various versions of a narrative. Uh, the most likely explanation is that all ancient narratives originated with an oral tradition, which fostered a shared cultural memory. And eventually these stories were written down and this uh, locked them into a particular temporally situated linguistic and cultural influence. So this has been studied and explored more thoroughly with Homer's epics, the process of oral transmission and versions of stories. Um, the oldest flood account is probably Atrahasis, uh, it's old Babylonian version dated to around 1700 BCE, so second millennium. Uh, many scholars believe that Atrahasis is the source for the narrative contained in the Epic of Gilgamesh because older third millennium Gilgamesh accounts don't have the flood narrative in them. Um, so it was something that was added likely after Atrahasis was, was formed um, or written down even. 
uh, later, and then later versions of Gilgamesh include this kind of flood story that mirrors. And again, because there's several versions, you know, my summary pulled from a, some specifics from a version, but they're all similar enough, I guess, to make that comparison. Yeah. Um, so just as the names, we saw the names of the deities, if you heard, uh, kind of altered between the Adrahasis account and the Gilgamesh account, right. uh, so other cultures imported their local deities into these famous stories. So it was a famous story, and then they'd put their own presence or, or petition in there, or deities in there. Um, so this may also be the case for similarities in the biblical occurrence, mm. which refers to God as Elohim. Um, interestingly, rather than using the personal name Yahweh for God. So we get this um, kind of more broadly used term for God, Elohim, uh, which has its own uh, various uses in the Bible. The Hebrew flood account is likely written much later than these other narratives. Uh, so there's no way of knowing when the oral tradition branched off from the more widespread traditions. Uh, to tell the Judahite version of the flood narrative uh, because of the, the writing. We only know more about when things are written. We don't really know where the stories originated orally. Right. Um, one, uh, one scholar uh, who's a colleague at a university I taught at for a while described this sort of retelling as similar to a cover band playing a famous song. Okay. So the Hebrews telling of the flood story with God and Noah could be compared to uh, Billie Eilish singing her late, her version of the Beatles classic song yesterday. Nice. And then that version might become the first or only version that younger people hear. Uh, I think that's as good of an analogy as any for how oral narratives are spread and borrowed with creative allowances in the ancient world. Uh, however, as I mentioned in the earlier interview about creation narratives, there was often a political reason to retell these stories uh, with one's own God as the deity, uh, providing a people group with their own localized version of the hero and of the, um, of the emergence for their own people and their own safety and their own theology. Uh, so while Atrahasis was the Babylonian's uh, wise person and Utnapishtim was the sage of eternal life for Gilgamesh's quest, Noah personified um, kind of a, a rest or repose for a deity who trusted humans enough to establish a covenant with this lesser species of humanity. Which brings us nicely right into the next question. Yeah. Um, how does this character Noah, and you can take this anyway, either similarities or dissimilarities, but how does the character of Noah compare to the characters of the Atrahasis and the Gilgamesh? I tend to, um, the first thing I look at when I look at a character in an ancient text is I try to find out what the name means and, and what it means for the local language and also what, um, what the name, what the morphology of the name or the roots of the names are. So I'll start with that, uh, which I alluded to just a minute ago. Um, Atrahasis actually means exceedingly wise and that's set out at the beginning of the narrative. Atrahasis means exceedingly wise. Um, so his story is that of a model citizen. He is favored by the gods. He has a relationship with his gods. So in that way, it might, um, I'm just thinking right now that uh, it kind of sounds like the introduction to the beginning of the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible. You know, he is the ideal person. Right. He's the person that you want to emulate. He does everything right. And he has this um, special communion with, with the deities. Mm -hmm. And so um, we get that from Atrahasis, this, this example. Uh, Utnapishtim uh, means one who finds life, and that's also given to us in the narrative uh, because Gilgamesh is seeking eternal life, so Utnapishtim is the, the model of immortality, having survived the flood. Um, so his story becomes one of fantastic survival um, and becoming immortal, his pursuit for immortality. So it's not as much the, the journey of the everyman, but he is an ideal he has reached this ideal nirvana or whatever of life where he has achieved the unachievable through his act of, I, I guess, of obedience or uh, trusting in the gods. Um, Noah is, is like Atrahasis. He's a human who communicates with God and hears from God. So he has that very similar to Atra, the Atrahasis narrative. And I would think even more similar to Atrahasis than Unapishtim. Uh, Noah is one of many chosen people in the biblical text. So whereas Atrahasis is the, the hero who follow, who goes through the epic, and then um, Gilgamesh, even though um, Unapishtim is, is a hero for a small part, but we have this large epic about Gilgamesh. In the Hebrew Bible, we have all of these chosen people. We have these short stories of many chosen people. So instead of getting an epic, I think the closest thing we have to 
epics in the Hebrew Bible is maybe Abraham and his sons and his son's sons. And, and I think that's about it. And then we have this big break, you know, and then we have Moses. Um, but his story, we don't get the story of his children and right. et cetera. So uh, I think in that sense, the biblical text is very different. I know it is extremely unique from these other two uh, figures. Uh, and, and also in that respect, Noah does not receive immortality for his faithfulness. He doesn't get a gift. He doesn't even go on to live a sinless life um, of example. I mean, he kind of, he stumbles and yeah. really hits the, hits the bottom right after this. So, right. you know, his story is kind of unique in, in that way that he's not really great in any fantastic way. Right. He comes across as almost uh, having some kind of survivor's guilt. Um, where he just <laughs> yeah. devastated um, that my that motion isn't declared in the Hebrew Bible, but he immediately goes into cultivating grapes and making wine out of it, and then becomes um, way too addicted to the con- uh, consumption of wine that it seems to debilitate him and lead to um, the event with his son in the tent that is often widely interpreted as many different things, but seems to be a very terrible outcome for his life. Um, and that way he doesn't come across as terribly heroic. Um, mm-hmm. is, is that kind of what, what we're getting here is that he's a little less heroic than the other characters? <laughs> I think so. I mean, just off the top of my head and, yeah. and thinking about the comparisons between the characters, um, I think that he, I think that in this version, God shines and not mm-hmm. necessarily Noah. Yeah, uh, in the other versions, the humans are obviously, you know, they're the sympathetic character for a reader who's a human audience. Um, yeah. But in this story, uh, you really, I think, I am i don't know. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done any real deep looking into it, but I think off the top of my head, I would I would agree. Yeah. That, that is an extremely flawed character. And in some ways that makes him more sympathetic. Yeah. Um, but definitely makes God the the protagonist of the of the narrative right so switching over to god in genesis (laughs) uh what is the creator's rationale for destroying humanity with the flood it seems that seems pretty over the top to just decide i'm going to wipe out humanity especially from modern sensibilities and then how does the creator's rationale in genesis compare with the rationale in other flood mythologies for this cataclysmic event yeah. Um, in, so in the Genesis account, God steps in to undo the universe because it's evil and chaotic. And of course, I won't get into it, but the famously strange, probably the strangest passage in Genesis is in Genesis 6 with the Nephilim right. and these gods seeing the beautiful women of earth and coming down and sleeping with them and making these great men of old. I mean, it's absolutely bizarre uh for the rest of like compared to the rest of genesis and the rest of the hebrew bible so um i i i'd be i don't know anyone who doesn't fully who fully tries to understand that passage right Uh, but uh god steps in in response to this and this is the excuse it's like this is the worst behavior the writers i guess could think of to put in there that this makes the world evil and chaotic so uh god steps in to set right the universe through this through means um, I think, I mean, it leads us to more questions and answers about what God wants here because uh, God sees all this evil, but then preserves Noah. So you wonder if God just had one chance at the pattern of humans and didn't want to try and recreate that pattern or I, I don't, I get a lot of, que- I have a lot of questions when I sit with a text for, for a time like this. Right. Um, but Noah, I mean, I think the whole thing about God remembering um, I know when I'm teaching, my students are always bothered when the Bible says that God remembers someone or remembers something because it suggests that God has a capability to forget. Uh, but as a character, if you're looking at God in a literary, as a literary character in the Hebrew narrative, um, God, for, God forgets and remembers, and it happens more than we, we want to think that it happens. And, and so Noah becomes um, God's, you know, uh, what is it, a ribbon around his wrist <laughs> to say like, oh, wait, I have something here I need to remember. And, and Noah is this reminder that humans deserve a second chance. And in some ways, it could be a punishment for these gods who have 
I don't know, misacted in Genesis 6 or whatever. I mean, from an ethical perspective, I'm not sure what's going on. So I'm going to stop stumbling around on guesses on that. Um, and I, I think it's clear, though, in Atrahasis and Gilgamesh, uh, the Enlil, Elil god, which are the two names used for the, the god that is wants to actively destroy people is clearly it's very simplistic he's annoyed he's bothered by the people there's a lot of talk about clamoring noisy people and there's a lot of synonyms used for noisy and keeping him from his sleep and from his rest and he can't do what he wants so that i mean the starkest difference between these accounts is that um god is trying to correct for chaos and evil and reorder the world and universe and and in the other, we have, again, like in the cosmogenies, we have this, uh, these debating gods who have different perspectives on what should be done, on how humans should be cared for, on what should happen with humans, and they fight amongst one another. And so what comes out of that is, uh, you know, are just all these different sides of really reflections of humanity right. and the arguments of the gods. It reminds me of our discussion in the last interview about the Enuma Elish, where you have the gods um, eventually kind of going to war with each other because the elder god is upset about the noise being created. Uh, it, and so almost in sense, they, I, when I read Genesis 6 through 9, I find it very troubling that the creator is depicted as wiping out humanity. And the craziness of the beginning of Genesis 6 with um, the sons of God and the daughters of men and this kind of weird divine human hybrid that comes from um, their sexual activity that at least all of a sudden it, it feels like the author is trying to give a okay this is how terrible it is at least our it what yes the god god or the gods did cause flooding but the reason is so much better than just annoyed gods so it, it it's weird because it's still for a modern sensibility as we're going man like killing humanity seems like a little over the top um but it feels like the Hebrew version of over the top is less over the top than what we see in some of these other stories where it's like, oh, I was just irritated. So I decided to wipe um, them out. Um, on a side note, my students will watch the less than ideal but interesting 2014 film Noah. Um, Excellent. And, and because, mostly because not that, and as they'll see, they're actually going to read the Genesis 6 through 9 story and see that this takes you like 20 minutes to read these four chapters. And wow. then... Um, 2014 film is a two hour long movie. And I, it's very clear that this is not just a retelling of Genesis 69, including what appears the watcher to be the watchers from first Enoch, um, which is a, an attempt to interpret Definitely. Genesis six and go, what are these divine <laughs> beings? And they kind of like what we might use the language, like fallen angels that come down and, and step beyond the divine human realm and, and mix those realms so that the human realm has to be washed away. And, it's just amazing to see that in ancient Jewish mythologies and even in modern retellings, that passage there, that very beginning of Genesis chapter six is basically the spark for so many imaginations of what, what this means and how we can retell this story and, and basically justify um, God wiping out humanity. So yeah, <laughs> fascinating thing there. Yeah. But, but again, I still read this story and go, I feel a little uncomfortable with humanity being wiped out. Um, but at least it wasn't because they were noisy, just too noisy. So I guess it's a positive yeah, upgrade. Um, so good. On this question of flood mythologies, I'll ask you the same question I asked you in creation mythologies. Mm -hmm. For my students who may be taking this course and saying, man, I was, I'm just taking this course to learn Bible, Bible stories. Um, why do I need to understand all the ancient Near East? So, so let's answer that question. Why is it important for students of the Bible to understand the ancient Near East? Israel's neighboring cultures, and in our particular context for this interview, comparative flood mythologies. Great. Uh, well, I, I think it's very important for anyone wanting to understand what these stories mean to discover the truth about where they came from. Uh, we have so much knowledge about languages and literature from the ancient world, uh, knowledge that brings us closer to the people who wrote the text and to those who told these stories for generations before they were written down. To ignore the context of the biblical text is to embrace ignorance at this point, uh, especially for those who seek virtue in the Hebrew Bible. Their task should be driven by a motivation to increase the quality of reading for better understanding. Mm -hmm. And that is gained by understanding the context of the text and, the, and even of the narratives that are contained within. I, I think it's an extremely important activity. 
that's a good answer. And, and I think it goes back to the answer that we had last time that if you really want to understand these texts um, in 2D, then just, just read the text. You can get a lot out of it. Um, but if you really, really care about these texts and these stories and you want a, a what we might call a 3D take on it, you need to shape the world from which the story came around the story as much as possible. Reconstruct it as much as possible and start, try, try to think like a little more like ancient people. Otherwise, you're going to completely read it through your own lens and your own lens does not include all the presumptions and ideas that the ancient world does. So, Right, yeah, for sure. Now, we could have talked about this with the last interview. I, I totally sidestepped the whole debate about the relationship between ancient creation mythologies and modern, um, what we might call cosmologies of right. how the universe came about and evolution and so forth, uh, though we did get a mention of Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> that was good. Um, but I do want to talk about this particular topic as far as the question of did it happen this way? Because I think we can look at the creation narrative, especially Genesis 1 and 2, and maybe see a little more of a poetic um, aspect. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we look at flood mythologies, I think the big question, even though most modern <clears throat> geologists are going to say, as far as I understand, there's not evidence for some kind of global catastrophe to this level. So a lot of readers are concerned with the question, did the flood really happen? And so my question here to end this particular interview is, uh, how important is that question? What should our focus be when reading these narratives? Is it really about what we might call, did it happen in history or is there something else going on? Nice. Um... Well, historically, we know that floods happened regularly in ancient Mesopotamia. The narrative itself, none of the narratives tell us how far and wide the flood spread. And the people who passed these stories down to their children did not likely know anything about the world outside of the borders of Egypt and Babylon. Mm. Uh, so we don't have any cartography evidence or any geographers giving us scientific <laughs> um, answers, and that's frustrating to a modern reader. Right. Uh, in the modern world, our tendency is to prove an historical event with scientific evidence and journalistic questions. We ask who, what, when, where, and why, and we're trained to do that in the Western world uh, from a young age. Uh, but the ancient texts do not prioritize our modern criteria for history or a historical event, and, and I think that's significant to understand first, you know, before we determine how, how we're going to read the text. Right. Um, I think kind of related to this, I think it's interesting that about five years ago, a very early account of the Atrahasis epic was discovered by Irving Finkel in the British Museum. Mm -hmm. This Sumerian tablet was a really incredible find because it included something that other flood texts lacked, and that was a complete and detailed description of the ark of the boat. Um, dimensions, how to build it, what was used in very, like, very complete detail. Um, so it described the boat as a coracle, which would have described the, I mentioned earlier, the width and length in harmony, mm -hmm. which is a round type of river boat. Uh, and this kind of boat was known to be commonly used for ancient river transport. Um, so of course, the one described in the Sumerian tablet was rather large by, you know, by comparison to any normally used river boat, it was ginormous. Uh, this description of the Ark then presents a floating device that looks quite different than the long rectangular boat presented in the biblical account. Um, and I think this is significant because a comparison like this provide, might provide some insight into the Hebrew priorities for writing this narrative. Uh, scientifically, the round coracle makes much more logical sense. It's a, it, it's a river boat and it, it would float and it, you know, you don't need a boat that's going to go anywhere and you don't have a motor like a schooner to push it anywhere anyway. <laughs> Um, the boat, a round boat would float more easily withstanding a better weight distribution for a large capacity. Uh, but the Hebrew Bible is not a modern scientific text, as I feel like I'm always remembering to say when I talk about ancient texts. Um, it is a religious text. Mm -hmm. The shape of the Ark in Noah's story looks an awful lot like the shape of the temple when the temple is built. And when compared, and we think about the fact that Noah's name means rest or repose, and the shape of the Ark mirrors a place of spiritual sanctuary, uh, then the Hebrew flood narrative becomes not about a great and fearful event administered by, God, administered by gods who are out to get humans. It is a story of one God who's concerned with providing a way of salvation for those who trust and follow, 
even when it is the same God who also creates the mean of, means of suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think here we can get a very significant theological um, implication that is being pressed in the Hebrew narrative, the flood account, that doesn't occur in the other, the Atrahasis or the Gilgamesh accounts. Um, so, so I think it's important for students to, or anyone who, who wants to raise the quality of reading of the biblical text, to think about what their priorities are. And like you mentioned before, uh, being intentional about the lenses that we are putting before the text so that we can read and understand for our own uh, rather than reading and understanding for our own agenda, that we can read and understand what's, what's the text trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then we can create a hermeneutic process for bringing that into our worldview. If that's, you know, for many people, that's the priority, of course, with the biblical text is to bring it in for an ethical, religious, or spiritual perspective. Um, and, I think, and I think for me, that's the most significant um, spiritual quality of the text is, is thinking about God providing a way of salvation which is a constant theme throughout the Hebrew Bible and even into the New Testament for Christians who, who have adopted the, the Hebrew Bible. Um, and I think, too, it's significant to maybe think about um, the theophany of the text, you know, even that there is even a point of salvation that's provided when God, when it is the God self providing or creating the means of suffering actively and then also creating a means of salvation from it. I mean, that's a significant, that's a significant and deep question or thought to sit with right. um, from this text. It's been fascinating as we've done these two interviews, and I hope my students are realizing how magnificent a editorial project that the Hebrew Bible is. Even from the beginning of this interview, we're talking about how Genesis 6 through 9 is almost a Genesis 1 through 2 over again. And even people who have been lifelong readers of the Bible sometimes either know that in the back of the head, but they're not thinking about it. They're focusing on other parts. But really, we have this attempt at another creation story. So flood mythology in the Hebrew Bible is almost another creation mythology. Um, but then even you mentioned, and my students will be aware, that there's been a lot of scholarship around Genesis 1 being kind of a, a temple type. Yeah. Um, story where God is creating a house for himself or a home for himself or God's self um, in the in Genesis 1. Elohim builds this temple. There's a lot of um, almost like a priestly characteristic to humanity. And now when you mentioned here, the ark is kind of a temple where there's a divine relationship with humanity in that particular sense. We have another intertwining. And the more you study the Hebrew Bible, the more these things pop up over and over again, these networkings, interconnections, intertwinings, where um, I now am in my late 30s, I've been reading the Bible pretty intensely since I was in my late teens, and you don't go back to the text and say, well, I've really, really figured this thing out. Like, I don't think there's anything more new to see. It, it's something you come back to almost every time you come back to it. You're like, oh, wow, there's that narrative connection, or there's that editorial um, seemed that I didn't see before. And it makes the book a fascinating mm. collection that um, is part of the reason why some of us, this is a lifelong thing for us. Um, yeah. Most of my students will major in religion. Um, some of them have and will, but if they do, uh, they can know that there's plenty of material out there to keep on finding and searching for, uh, for yeah. years on years on end. So Excellent. Thank you so much for another great conversation and really opening up the world of the Hebrew Bible for me and my students. Um, I'm excited to hear what their feedback is. And of course, I'll pass that along to you in thank the you. future. So thank well, you. thank you, Brian. I, I really appreciated this opportunity. It was really amazing. It's been fun. Thank, thank you.